This week, we welcome John Behager, Network Plus Review Course Instructor at Cybex for the interview segment of the show. In the technical segment, we welcome back Mr. John Morin. He's a Senior Product Manager at DF Labs. He's going to talk about how SOAR can be used to enhance incident response and forensics. In the security news, seven new Spectre and Meltdown attacks. Hacking ATMs uh, is easy because they run Windows XP. AI can now fake fingerprints fooling ID scanners. And Japan's cybersecurity minister, uh, minister, yes, admits he's never used a computer. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. Domain tools help security analysts turn threat data into threat intelligence. They take indicators from your network, including domains and IP addresses, and connect them with new nearly every active domain on the internet. Those connections drive risk assessments, help profile attackers, guide online fraud investigations, and map cyber activity to attacker infrastructure. Fortune 1000 companies, global government agencies, and leading security solutions vendors use the Domain Tools platform as a critical ingredient in their threat investigations and proactive defenses. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash domain tools. Oh, good evening. Here we are, Thursday. I would like to introduce you to a man who loves to get his strawberries daily. Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. <clears throat> it is, in fact, episode 583. We're recording on November 15th, 2018. And we're, of course, in G-Unit Studios. To my left, <clears throat> the lovely April Wright. Hello. Here in studio, so now... You can just imagine the hilarity <laughs> that will ensue that's already... Uh, are you well dried off now? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly. There's still some... Uh, the floor may be slippery. There's like a... a it should be a sign or something. It's one of those things. I just It happens when you do a show and, you, you know, production. We like to, you know, make sure drinks have guests and... Uh, drinks have guests? No, guests have drinks even. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I'm always, you know, nervous about what could ensue when we have guests in the studio, miking them up, giving them liquids, spilling things on them. It happens every once in a while. That's so, fine. yes. On the lines, uh, I don't know if it's via, I don't know what's, I always get tripped up here because is it on the lines via Skype? If they're not on via Skype, Jeff Mann is here with us on the lines via Skype. Apparently, I'm supposed to say that, Jeff, so welcome. Hi, this is Jeff Mann coming to you from Skype. And uh, I'm glad to be here, and I'm dry. It's, it, although it did snow here today. I thought you had time. some wine, though, Jeff. Well, I'm, I, but I haven't poured it on myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> Stay tuned for that <laughs> in this week's security news. Also on the lines via Skype, Mr. Joff Thayer is here with us. Joff, welcome. Good evening. Apparently I'm blurry. I don't know why I'm blurry, or is that me? I thought you were Joff, but... Uh, okay, I'm blurry Joff. Uh, blur yeah, it's good to be here. Um... Good to see you, and great to uh, be at home for a little while. So, hey, holiday week coming up. Looking forward to it. And I'm going to be teaching next week after Thanksgiving in Stockholm. Wow, crazy. It's awesome. Ooh. It's awesome. Ooh. You know, after 16 gin and tonics, everyone looks blurry. Josh. Maybe, maybe that's it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> also on the lines via Zoom, Mr. Carlos Perez. Carlos, welcome. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. <laughs> yes, nice to uh, nice to have you. I see you cleaned up a little bit behind you. You kind of you got a lot of things oh, yeah. going on in your house, right? You're at the three kid mark, so cleanliness yeah. is not always uh, the highest priority. Or if it is, it's impossible to keep the house clean. Yeah, I got like to the point that uh, office, so. even though I work from home, I am actually renting an office to be able to get mm -hmm. some peace and quiet to work. <laughs> yep, that happens. Uh, oh, okay, uh, quick announcement before we get started. If you're interested in 
quality over quantity and having meaningful conversations instead of just a badge scan, join us on April 1st through the 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort for InfoSec World 2019, where you can learn, uh, where you can connect and network with like-minded individuals in search of actionable information. Make sure when you register... Use the registration code OS19-SECWEEK for 15% off the main conference or a world pass. John, oh God, now I forgot. See, I had it for the intro, and now I don't have it. John's here with us. John, tell us about yourself, <laughs> including how to pronounce your last name. Hey, how you doing, guys? Uh, John Behager, actually, Behager. and uh, it's great to be with you guys. Uh I've uh, I've actually worked in the field for probably 20 years, and 20 years as an educator, and uh, just got the opportunity recently to uh, to write a couple books. So happy to share my experience and uh, education with everyone. Fantastic. Uh, now, yeah. So you uh, and is, so well, tell us about what is the Cybex thing just before we get started. Uh, so you've written some books for for Cybex. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Originally, I started out doing tech editing and uh, kind of fell in love with it and uh, just started started writing, got an opportunity to do the network, actually the CCNA routing and switching exam uh, book and uh, just went off from there. Kind of actually felt like I cheated on that one because it was a question and answers book and uh, didn't have any writing. You know, I didn't have mm. any literary artistic to it. Uh, so when I got the network plus, I was jumping for joy and, uh, got through that. Now I'm actually doing an A plus book. Nice. Nice. Um, <clears throat> so I, I want to ask, cause uh, you know, when we guide people who are coming into the field, I always tell them, I'm like, you need to read TCP IP illustrated volume one by Richard Stevens. And they're like, well, we covered some of that stuff in our class. I'm like, no, 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 no. If you're going to work here. So I just told our, our intern, if you're going to work here, you got to read that book because I feel every network and security professional should read that book. Although that material is covered in both the CCNA and CompTIA network plus, or uh, I'm deferring to you as the expert, John. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, they're the, they're the basis of both of those courses. Now, of course the, the, the Cisco over the last couple of years, I'd say probably the last uh, probably 10 years, it's gotten a lot more in depth on security on uh, not so much, it's always been based on routing and switching, but it's kind of veered off to, of course, wireless. Now they've come out with a new wireless certification, so we see less of that. Uh, but the, the guts is TCP IP. I mean, there's a couple good chapters, and I love talking about TCP IP. You know, when, when you get down to the nuts and bolts, talking about Windows, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, I've taught that for the last 20 years. Well, not those, but Windows in general. Uh, they change every version. Now, what, 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 every six months, we have uh, a version change with Windows 10. TCP IP has not changed all that much, other than using, like, subnet zero, you know? Uh, and that's probably a change within the last, what, 10, 12 years. <clears throat> um, sorry, someone is on their way to the studio, apparently. Uh, sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> So in, in both of those, you go through the, the, uh, the header fields for TCP and IP and all that stuff because students really and, – and why do you believe that students need that, that foundation? I, mean, I have my own thoughts and opinions, but I want to hear from you, John, because that's – when you're first getting the field, difficult material to get through uh, for a lot of people. But why is it so important? Well, the, the, the whole thing is if you don't understand what's happening at all the layers, you can't break the problem down. And I always see the diagnostic approach is something's happening, don't know what it is. It's the application. Oh, my gosh, the network's down, jump to conclusions. Whereas if you have an educated approach and you understand, you know, the, the seven layers of the OSI, and, and that sounds so cliche, right? But understand that more is happening than just TCP IP. There's applications, there's handoffs to the transport layer, and then you get into the TCP IP. I find that very rare do you have to pull out Wireshark to actually get down to a problem. But if you can pull out Wireshark and understand what's happening in the headers, you can actually solve the problem. So, uh, you know, that that's a worst case scenario where like we had a uh, an issue with VoIP where we couldn't get multicast to work and it was a TTL issue. We would have never seen it unless we looked at the dumps, but we had to know what we're looking for. Wireshark's just a tool. Like I used to be a mechanic and, uh, and I had a whole box full of tools. They were just tools. Without me, without my expertise, without my knowledge, 
those tools are just wrenches in a box or screwdrivers in a box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good analogy. Well, um, technically, they're just pieces of metal because if you don't know what they are, you don't have a name for them. Exactly. It. Cheers. Cheers. Um, so, uh, you teach now for a, a university as well, John? Is that is that true? Uh, well, actually, I taught for probably the last uh, probably eighteen years, and uh, and since I've been doing the books, and uh, I've actually done a, a series for Network Plus with uh, with um, Cybex for the Network Plus Review Guide. Uh, I've kind of taken a break from that, but uh, probably get back into teaching at some point. Nice. Now, is is there security curriculum in the Network Plus? So there's about, I think it's 23% uh, in the, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 23% in the Network Plus. And, uh, you know, what I often find is when you, when you look at a Network Plus, it's a very general exam. They try and cover a lot over a very, I'd say, broad topic of networking. So you get a little bit of everything, but you don't really drill down. I mean, uh, from an educator standpoint, uh, I used to teach courses in five and a half weeks, sometimes 11 weeks, and uh, what you had about four hours a week. So it's tough to drill down into, you know, the details of network, of network security to the level that you want. Uh, it is an element, but uh, I guess if I wanted to teach security, I'd have to go teach the Security Plus exam, which I have experience with as well. What, what's the, your recommendation for those getting into the field as to which certification they may want to obtain to help them achieve their goals if they want to work in security, let's say? So I'll tell you, that's, that's a great question. Um, I often find that when people go into security, everybody wants to be pen testers. And mm. that's, that's great. You know, that, that should be like an ultimate goal and work yourself up there. And if you want to really be a great pen tester, go speak at conferences, put yourself out there. But where you really need to start is like a network plus or even an A plus, because the A plus has a lot of networking in it now, too. Um, I used to teach pre preliminarily what we'd call ex milkmen, people that were dislocated, uh, say they were, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 years old and they wanted to get back into the workforce and they wanted to become IT professionals. And the first thing we started them out with was the A plus, gave them a good foundation. And then we kind of scaled it out from there, eventually getting up to the CCNA. But if you ask me, the A+, plus, Network+, plus, whichever one you favor, and then the CompTIA Security+, plus, hands down. Great, great exam to take. I agree for pen testers, at least. Um, I have the Network+, plus and Security+, plus, but I don't have the A+. Plus. Um, but yeah, the network, uh, knowing about how, the, how a network works is... It, going to be key if you are doing pen testing because you're going to be looking at oddities or or um, wireless or whatever you're trying to get into um, the security plus is uh, probably less helpful for pen testers than, than the network I would say um, but it depends what you want to do if you're trying to get into the field and you want to do pen testing which a lot of people do um, but if you want to be like um, blue team or you want to be um, more on uh, I mean even even like a sock or a blue team I think the networking is really helpful so yeah I think, I think I'd, that would I'd be even good argue days. as a developer I don't know if you want to challenge me on that April or, or John or anyone else but I think even as a software developer understanding that at least at a some level is extremely helpful in fact I, I don't think it is uh something optional i think it's mandatory mm. one of the things that we are now seeing nowadays is that everything's in the cloud so now your developers are also doing devops they're constantly deploying software up to web servers and they need to know how the web server works. They need to know how those requests work. Mm. And many times they have to even uh, write their code and their application to be able to be load balanced and scalable. And for that, you actually need to know your networking pretty well. Yeah. So yeah. right now, if you want to be a developer, I think nowadays it should be mandatory. I, I, yeah, and I think security should be mandatory too, but unfortunately mm -hmm. it isn't for most developers and neither is networking. You know, I, I, I couldn't agree more either because um, 
oh, I came from. Why am I blurry? <laughs> like that's not just my art. <laughs> Again, Josh, sixteen, <laughs> sixteen gin and tonics, John. <laughs> that's not just my eyes, man. You look like, perfectly crisp to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Like oh, a pressure. baby. Uh, anyway, um, no, I came. I came into information security after a long career of both systems administration and um, even longer career of of uh, a very large network administration and. The insight that that gives me, the the advantage that that gives me is huge, and I couldn't imagine being without that experience um, in, in you know in my life today. It it just was a massive, massive advantage in what I do every day. John, how how much do you think that those getting into the field today need to know about systems administration? I and mean, we talked about having a fundamental in networks, and I think Carlos is right in April too, right that. Even if your app is serverless, you still got to understand how the network works. However, as we push towards serverless, how much does everyone need to know about systems administration today? Or is that game changing so much that it just takes a different form? Changing entirely. I mean, there's a lot more options now, right? So if you're going towards an AWS platform, you have, uh, what is it, IAM, the, uh, the security model on there. Uh, there's there's a number of services and the administration of an AWS is going to be way different than you know of an, an Active Directory domain. But when it comes down to the fact, everybody still has Active Directory as their authentication system locally or an Office 365. Uh, what we've seen as a trend in the last uh, five to ten years, probably the last five years, it's really gained traction is uh, federated services. And there's a lack of understanding of of how federated services work. Um, I mean, it's just really basically passing a claim in behalf of uh, the the authenticated person, but nobody really understands those nuts and bolts. And I, I tell you, out of all of the certifications, I think all of the certifications I've, I've reviewed or taught, they just touch a little bit on that identity management. So when it comes down to a network administration versus security, I'm going to say you probably need to be equally versed in both of them. But uh, the game is changing. Amazon Web Services is kind of, you know, changing that game. Even Google uh, and some of the other uh, uh, providers. I would argue that it would depend massively on what you're developing as well. If you're developing mobile, you may not need to understand how a, a Unix system works as well, or a Windows system, or how to administer those things, or how does the registry work. Versus if you're writing a web application you probably don't need to understand so much about the registry or whatever and, and making changes to users but if you're writing um if, if you're developing for an operating system then i you think that would, yeah that. i mean that's that's critical well, so, i mean to your point does that mean as an operating system you have to understand ios or android if but would you call that system administration no no you do not yeah i think we're Systems administration and operating system understanding are probably two different areas of expertise, right? Right. right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I believe all security professionals should have system administration experience. Uh, that's why we're always telling them, hey, get a lab, set up a lab, learn how stuff works, set it up in an environment, learn what are the defaults, learn how it works, learn the ins and outs, because uh, most of the time when you're doing a pen test, you can either be one of two pen. Uh, type of pen testers you can or red teamers you can be a tool monkey that only knows this is a hammer i'm going to hit this until it gets me what i want or probably will never get, uh, give me what i want or you can actually understand what your tool is doing how it's inter interacting with the service what are the iocs you're generating how can you persist in the environment if you get detected by edr you can probably guess hey the cdr software or ab software is detecting me because I know how this interacts with the OS. I know that it's generating this stuff that typically is common. Let me find ways to obfuscate all of this stuff. If you don't have that base knowledge on the OS and how stuff works, you're going to be, in my opinion, a mediocre pen tester or red teamer. Same thing goes for its response. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, my, my wife's in, in X ray tech and in ultrasound tech. And in X ray school, they had to assemble an x-ray machine like they had to actually like physically put one together to understand how it works i feel like so many people coming into our field like we don't have that same standard right that they learn about the execution of it but not exactly 
how it's built. And so we just hired actually uh, an intern here for Security Weekly. And I'm like, dude, your first task, I'm like, you see that big hunk of iron over there, that server? I'm like, you got to put Linux on it, right? Like, yeah, there's all these things, cloud and virtual and all that stuff. But I feel like if you don't ha have that fundamental knowledge and haven't like suffered in front of a, a terminal, in front of a real server and tried to make it work, that you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. I, I just feel like you're a better network systems or, or security person if you've done that. John, did you have exercises like that for students to go through or, or have thoughts on like how we should coach people to get into the, the different fields? You know, I, I often find that um, people learn like chmod or they'll learn the se linux command but only to either grant everyone privileges or turn mm -hmm. se linux off but not understand how it actually works like one of my one of my uh, uh, prior junior admins uh years ago his thing was as first as as soon as he set up a box he turned the firewall off mm -hmm. and i was like why, 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 why are you doing that like tough it out learn the firewall just set it up um and his his thing was yeah i gotta get the server up you know I, I, we they, people coming into the field have to understand those basic pieces of information as far as security goes, because I, I just find people just circumventing the system. And and as a fact, if you look at like, uh, what was it, uh, Windows XP Service Pack 2, they turned on the firewall by default. Now, over all of these years, there's been a lot of people turning that firewall off. But as a fact, if you look at today, we have less worms in, in, uh, in, in circulation, and we ha have less... I don't want to say less exploits because there's exploits all the time, but less network-based exploits because people are leaving that firewall turned on and toughing it up. And we've actually automated a lot of, not we, but the security community in general, uh, have automated a lot of installs to put firewall rules in there. Uh, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a key thing is understanding the basics uh, before you, you, know, you, you jump in and start, you know, hey, look, I set up a server. Great. Well, you have a GUI on it. Why? Right. Jeff. Uh, I'm enjoying this conversation and I agree wholeheartedly with what everybody's saying. But I think, you know, coming at this from a 35 plus year professional that started with the DOD that learned security before it was the Internet and servers and workstations and technology, um, I I hear the frustration in everybody and the, and the sort of the ugh, how can you do any of this if you haven't you know gotten the basics down. I feel exactly the same way, but my idea of what the basics are don't even discuss technology uh, at all. You know, having a basic understanding of security, what's what it's what is it all about for your organization, for your institution, or your customer? Uh, what are the goals? You know, obviously, technology is a big part of all this, but to me, there's this whole, and I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, there's so many people that circumvent and get around, yeah, we don't want to know that. We just want to jump into where we've been jumping into, which is the technology discussion. So, yes, everything that you guys have been saying, and then take this giant step backwards because there's this whole, um, topic of security information security data security same everything that everybody's been saying i would echo we everybody needs to have that basic understanding before we start doing the stuff that you guys are talking about everybody needs to start with if that makes sense i agree i think that's really important but how do how does somebody get that without it's like a chicken and egg scenario mm -hmm. how do you get that experience working with customers when you don't have any customers yet when you're just in a lab <laughs> like how i mean what are what are your thoughts on that like john do you have any you go out you go out and get a job with somebody and do your time that's how you get that <laughs> that's that's my opinion i'm sticking to it john do you have I advice uh, i mean john you you teach uh you know students and in, in create curriculum so What's your advice as, you know, April says it's a chicken and egg problem. How do I get the experience? You know, how do I get the job without the experience and the experience without the job? I, I tell you, over, oh gosh, I, last 20, 25 years uh, of doing this, I've seen people that, uh, well, let's let's take a step back. Um, IT people are introverts. And uh, when you go to like a con or, you know, like DEF CON or not a con or, or one of the cons, I, I I see the people that put themselves out there, that talk with other people, trying to understand their ideas. 
they're the ones that gain not just professionalism, but also expertise just by talking with people and finding out, you know, problems that they've dealt with. But then, uh, you know, also getting, putting your dues in. Uh, I mean, you, you got to get a job and you got to go through the, the ranks and you got to do a lot of log watching before you get to the fun stuff. I mean, it's just putting in your dues. And going back to uh, another point there, understanding the information security aspect is a key piece. Uh, I mean, I haven't found one book that covers that completely, uh, including the stuff that I've written, um, where you're starting out, you know, from, hey, this is a piece of paper. Now it has identifiable information on it. How do you treat this throughout its life cycle? I mean, those are those are key topics, right? Um, but going back to the question, uh, I'd say probably putting yourself out there and getting real world experience by putting your dues in. And by dues, I would I would say also volunteering is a really good way to, to do that. Like, yeah, yeah. It, part, being in the CFT or uh, uh, <laughs> being in the competitions and, and volunteering and tr being on a knock or I mean, I know like uh, Shmukan has a really good program where you can volunteer to uh, help set up the network and you get to learn all kinds of technologies that you'd never get to touch and you don't that's really it april it. english english you're doing well <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact one of the areas that i think none of us has touched on is actually learning a bit about how actual businesses work how do people inside of those businesses interact uh, many times as security professionals we go into customers and we just go like hey either the bid is on or off others white or black and when it comes to business it is we're just one more cog in the business machine to generate money or to achieve its mission if we're not able to identify as a cog where are we in that machine we're not going to be able to actually provide value and many times i talk with security professionals start going like no we need to do this and and go like cool and how does that help the business? I think, yeah, it will make your environment a lot more secure, but also you're going to put such a burden on users and into the process that it's going to take them probably twice as long to do some of the tasks yeah. that they're doing. That's going to impact very negatively the, uh, the business, especially for your business that is very competitive. And they're going like, oh, I don't care, but they're going to be more secure. And it reminds me of the guy from the Phoenix project, the security uh, guy gonna say he kept Phoenix, going man. around with his binder without understanding how the business actually work he just scared about them being yeah. fully what was his name was that john being was his name john his name was john right i think so the security guy in the i think that's project. right yeah. yeah yeah and that's one of the parts that many of us actually shy away from like oh we don't want to learn how to talk with people oh we don't want to learn about how our, my organization works or how to a business actually works i just want to go into my own cubicle into my own little world of bits and bytes and stay there and we have to kind of break a bit out of our shell and kind of move move, move out, outward there carlos I, I completely agree and I, I want to pivot into another area that i think is very critical for those uh studying certifications and training and getting into the field and that's the aspect of troubleshooting john how do you as they're learning teach them how to troubleshoot right i feel like a lot of courseware is kind of preset and and put together and you don't learn those troubleshooting skills until like Matt, our intern came in and I handed him a Linux box and said, have at it. Like I'll help you when you get stuck, which is important to have a mentor, but you, part of the learning process with our interns like Matt is teaching that person how to troubleshoot and how to deal with the stressful situation of troubleshooting, which is another aspect of it. Well, that's, that's a, a whole personality. Uh, like Carlos was saying, you have to be able to talk to people. Uh, mm -hmm. And I always tell people, I always tell when, uh, uh, students when they're learning troubleshooting is that the first thing you have to do is you have to collect all of the evidence to support the problem, right? So you can isolate that problem, narrow it down, and then like we just had an instance where there's a, it's either the network, the application, or the user's doing something. You wanna isolate, I mean, everything breaks down to what, either hardware, software, or the user. Right, but isolate that down. The only way you're going to do that is collect information from people, and you have to talk to them. You can't carry on a conversation through email. I mean, a lot of my junior admins, 
through the years, I've had to whip them with a stick, not literally, but whip them with a stick to, 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 to get them to actually communicate. And now I, I work with a great crew. They, they, you know, pick up the phone first sign of trouble and they talk with the user. They collect that information. And then the other thing is just reproducing the problem. Mm. And of course, you know, we always want to jump to conclusions. Isn't that like an office space game or something? Yeah. Uh, and, and the thing is, John, I think early on when you're learning troubleshooting, you have to get over that like innate human kind of characteristics of it's not my problem. It's not me. I didn't change anything. Right. <laughs> that's exactly. like, I'm like, no, no, no. Throw all that out the window. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. You know, I, I remember I used to work with a guy and I'd say, okay, go back through the steps and show me. And he'd be like, well, I just told you about it. And I was like, no, 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 no I want to no, see no. it with yeah. my own eyes. And it was just so I didn't jump to my own biases and conclusions that, that I had preset in my head because yeah. I'm like, hey, it, it, it's not a network issue. It's an application issue. Send it to the developers, right? And then developers will kick it back to me. I've played those games for years. Uh, when you understand what's going on and you can reproduce it and articulate what the theory might be, that's when you can actually solve the problem and actually produce a, a result. And it's, it's interesting, you, you can teach those troubleshooting skills uh, early on, but then they have to apply them under pressure and stress. And that's one area where I really like hiring and working with people who have a military background, because one of the things they learn is how to deal with uh, and work under pressure and stress. Uh, that I only feel like you can learn from the military or if you've been in a real world job, right? And I think that's some of the, should be one of the skills that employers are looking for today. I think largely they're looking for keyword searches and, you know, certifications, but they should be looking for that skill set of, are you able to prioritize and execute? It's actually from a, a book I just, I just read, uh, Extreme Ownership, right? Prioritize and execute under pressure. And that's so hard. And how do you when you're interviewing somebody for a job, how, yeah, how do you, do you out? figure out if you can question. do that? Mm. Um, I mean, oh, uh, I, I have a good process for that. I, I remember oh, hiring no. <laughs> uh, like 10, 12 developers and we had a series of questions and we just simply threw problems at them and we told them from the get go, I don't care if the answer that you arrive to at the end is correct or not. I want to see what is your thought process yep. to resolve the problem. And sometimes we actually gave them problems that had zero solution. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to know what was their thought process on how they would do it. And then we looked for key stuff. Like, did they broke down the problem into small chunks to work yeah. on it? Yes, no. Did they mention, hey, I'm going to document this so I can have a process in case if I face this problem again, am I going to be able to work on it again? And that's a very big, important one. When you talk with many pen testers, with many red teamers, with many instant response or SOC people, you told you ask them, hey, do you guys at the end of engagements do AARs, after action reports, or do hot washes, which are meetings at the end where you put your ego outside the door mm. uh, when you go in and you simply go like, and you go like, hey, this is what we did right. This is what we did wrong. Let's learn from it. Let's come up with some action items and how are we going to fix this? and include it into our process so it won't happen again or we're ready or have a process to deal with with this in the case that we uh, confront it again. And when uh, I, th that was key for us when I worked at my previous job when I was hiring uh, developers and people to come into the team was what is that thought process? Is that thought process correct in terms of them being organized, setting processes, can they keep their ego outside? Because one, that's one of the reasons we gave them problems that they didn't have any solutions because at the end, I wanted them to fess up and say, you know what? I don't have a solution for this. Mm. Instead of bullshitting. If they start bullshitting it at the mm. end, I'm going, like, uh, red flag. I don't like this. That's a red flag. John, thoughts you know, on, I'll, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I was going to say real quick, um, I, I, a curmudgeon moment real quickly because I have two daughters that are educators and somebody, I, I forget who it was, was uh, ranting on Twitter the other day about the, the, the futility of, of math tests and math scores. And as Car Carlos was talking, I kept thinking, yeah, but young people today are not being taught to show their work or get credit for their work. They're, they're supposed to come up with the answer. So 
while I agree with what Carlos is saying, you want to learn, you want to see what people's thought processes are. You want to see how they work out problems. I'm not sure that that's necessarily being taught today, unless John hopefully can introduce and, or, and tell us that, you know, in some of his courses, uh, that there is that sort of element to it. Uh, but my curmudgeon, curmudgeon self says, says eh, I don't know if people can handle that kind of, that kind of pressure to just simply, you know, think creatively and show us what you work because they're so often not taught that today in, in many of our ed educational institutions. Yeah, and that's when you're actually uh, in the interview process. I actually go like, do you read books? Do you have a lab to to see if they're the kind of person that actually spent time learning and when they say oh i read many books i have an audible account or i have a kindle mm -hmm. uh and i go like what kind of books are you buying and one of the things that at least i uh, took points uh, because typically we did interviews in by committee was uh, are they reading books outside of the field mm -hmm. uh are they all mm -hmm. technical books or are they also looking like hey how to improve myself how to be more organized public speaking um are they reading books like Rework and others, Phoenix Projects, stuff that gives them a broader perspective? Because many times it, it, it is easy to kind of blame like, hey, I wasn't taught this or this wasn't part of my education. And that is a very valid point. But many times what I'm looking for is that A-type personality of a winner that goes like, you know what? I don't know this. I know. I think I, uh, I may. this may be a value for me. I'm going to learn it. I don't know how many A-type personalities there are in security. <laughs> uh, there, there are a lot, to be honest. I, I interviewed oh, many none at all <laughs> and, and hired many reverse engineers. And my my biggest problem was that A-type personalities like to debate. So many times, a lot of uh, a lot of my work was actually being a referee. <laughs> I remember that. John, uh, uh, Jeff was asking you uh, earlier about. Um, you know, how do we teach people to show their work, to work through problems and, and teach those skills? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one because, you know, there's an element of creativity that you just can't teach. Yep. But I, I tell you, I, I often find that when we look at, like, like Jeff was saying, against math, uh, people want to resolve the problem. Like when I teach a, a subnetting, uh, one of the things I have to do is uh, is break a prejudice of value because when, whenever we talk about uh, uh, binary values, zero is a is a value. And most people don't carry around zero dollars in their pocket. They've ta been taught you know one two three since they were a little kid. Um, when when people learn that new aspect that they've taken for granted, their eyes open up and they see a little bit of the creativity. At least I see that in my students. Um, but, but past that, you know, past the the analytical yeah, way. Yeah, hold on. Now, with my kids, zero is a number. And if their teacher tells them otherwise, there's a parent-teacher conference, just saying. Right. So a lot of us <laughs> right. are in that boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, that's, and that's a good thing because, you know, they, they need to learn early on that the number system doesn't start at one. Um, but, but like I said, you know, getting back to uh, the creativity aspect, when people learn that, they're like, wow, like there's a whole new world to computers that I didn't know about. And binary actually becomes fun learning rather than, oh, man, it's a new number system or hexadecimal. Like, you know, I got to remember all these values now. And, and again, we're talking very elemental here, but but it kind of brings in that creativity piece. Uh, it spawns learning. You know, it's interesting. You're, you're, I find it the elementary wait, school. Paul, level. Paul, wait. Wait, you're Hold blowing on. my mind. I need to ask this question. Is one <laughs> the loneliest number or is zero <laughs> the loneliest number? If a zero falls in the forest, does it? Wait, no, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's very binary. Sorry, go ahead, binary go answer. Ahead, um, I was just going to say when, you know, I, I, I look at what my kids are being taught in school. I often feel like that, that creativity, that troubleshooting, um, the comprehension isn't often as rewarded as it should be. Like they have to fit into a certain kind of, you know, well, profile and solve problems that, uh, you know, my son asked, my oldest son has very interesting questions. And I'm like, see, you're the kind of person that I would hire, right? I, not the person's getting 100 on every test. Like you're the person I would hire because of their like view of the world. And that's a difficult thing to teach. But it's also, I think, difficult for students, you know, coming up through school 
uh, to be rewarded for that. Troubleshooting is literally how you end up with career maturity yeah. and, and, and um, knowledge <laughs> maturity because you learn from failing more than you do from succeeding. So mm -hmm. it's, yes. uh, y you have to be able to fail regularly in order to move on. Uh, my, that, my, kid's martial arts coach so was, was, <laughs> my kid's martial arts coach was saying that, and I, I wanted to just perk up in front of all the parents and students and give the Churchill quote, right? Success is moving from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> so these are all difficult things to teach, John. I feel like we put you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, they, they are difficult things to teach. I mean, that's, you know, what you're describing is a classical education, right? Uh, uh, not understanding why, but asking why, right? Yeah. So not taking it for face value, but actually asking why it's face value. And and we, we don't, you know, I, my son's in, in eighth grade now. Uh, we just, they just don't learn that stuff. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that he has... Uh, uh, better brains than I did when, uh, when I was his age. Uh, and he is getting a hundred on tests, but he, he is also asking why, because I've beaten that into him. Uh, you know, we've, we've got to be like April was saying, we got to be expected to fail and ask why we failed. Yeah. I, I, it's difficult when you, you have a kid like that too, of keeping him out of anything. Like mm -hmm. I put it there. So, you know, you guys want to go in there and he's like, but if I just did this, then, you know, like the door would open. I'm like, yeah, all right. Let you just can I ask you not to go in there? I know I can't keep you out of anything, but it just becomes like an end user awareness and training moment <laughs> at that time rather than technically trying to keep your kids out because, you know, some of them are just more more hackers than others. And to your point, John, and uh, to, to the other point about um, uh, having uh, a classical education, um, that's that's being well rounded. You're you're trying to learn as many different things as possible. What books do you read that aren't, aren't technical? What are you doing to um, to learn as much as possible about everything? And that's what's going to make a good pen tester. It's not that you know yeah. how a network works or that you know how to administer an operating system. That's it's important that you too. Know. Well, yeah. and, and when when Paul's interviewing, he needs to ask the questions: What kung fu movies do you watch, and what <laughs> hip hop groups do you listen to? Hey, you know, Johnny Blaze works here, and it, we had that conversation during the interview. And I'm like, dude, we, we, we have the same musical interests, and you'll know what I'm talking about. And that was, like, one of the reasons why I hired him. Like, that's <laughs> someone to share my love of hip-hop with. It's great. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Something to be said for that. No skill, but really good at hip-hop. Right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let me say one more thing. We're not well, no, calling Johnny this has what skill. it is. You shouldn't say it. <laughs> has lots of skills um <laughs> a lot of what we've been talking about the last five ten minutes is uh, I, I think another way to, to describe it is critical thinking um somebody asked me what wants to define what a hacker was and and i i thought about it and i'm like well a hacker is somebody that knows how stuff works more than you do in, in one yeah. sense yeah you're and, right and the, i like that the yep. idea of the hacker mentality i mean i haven't touched i haven't broken into anything in 15 years i still consider myself a hacker because hacker to me is more of a state of mind it's a mindset it's the ability to critically think it's the ability to look at something and say that doesn't make a whole lot of sense there's got to be a, a different better way of doing things or simply what happens if you push this button mm -hmm. it says don't press this button so it's a it's a curiosity i think I'll, i've been thinking about this a lot for for years but i think a lot of what makes a hacker a hacker is critical thinking skills or the the things that we describe that are what makes a hacker a good hacker i think also can sort of fall under uh, a category of critical thinking and i asked the question and I don't, I don't know the answer to this. I really ask this question to a lot of people. Is critical thinking something that you're just born with? Is it something that uh, you can learn? Is it something that sort of has to be, you know, nurtured and cultivated or trained? You know, can you learn to be able to, to think critically and, and put it into our context? Can you learn to be a good hacker? Or is it there's something about your chemistry, your, your, your personality, your makeup – that that you know leads you down that path where yeah you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do well at this i have an opinion about that but i would add um also a willingness to try 
um, whether or not you're, you're, you plan to succeed or whether or not you expect to succeed mm. or expect a trophy or whatever, <laughs> millennials, um, but a willingness <laughs> to try. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think that that is, goes right along there with, um, with the critical thinking because um, without both, you're not going to have that hacker mentality. That's an excellent point. So wrap all that into a course, John, and, and we'll all take it. You know, what's interesting is, uh, just on a closing note, in teaching that critical thinking, one of my college professors uh, was really good at that, and he would do things like give us a lab that was purposely bad and impossible to come up with any kind of answer that could, you could defend, right? It was actually measuring a flame, right? And we're all doing this like, this doesn't make sense. And he's like, well, make it, make it work, make it work, right? And kept pushing us, pushing us until we all came with, up with theories that actually wouldn't map a flame, right? <clears throat> and then he said, yeah, I know that the lab was completely wrong. And now your job is to come up with something that comes closest to being able to, to do something like map the, map the flame and make the, the lab better. And now that I think about it after hearing this, really what he was teaching us was critical thinking, which was awesome. Um, so, John, you are um, teaching for Cybex, and the URL that I have for that is cybex.com forward slash go forward slash free trial. Um, how, does that, how does that work? Is this a course where people sign up for and it's all digital? Is that, is that true? Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that one, actually. I apologize. Uh, but uh, uh, I know that, uh, well, I just got finished with the Network Plus Review Guide uh, videos. Uh, through efficient learning and uh basically there there is a free trial for that mm -hmm. I believe it's that link I, I'm, I'm sorry i'm not uh, familiar with that link and uh it, and basically it's an online course where i teach all of the aspects of network plus awesome so john we just have five questions for you sure you ready to play five questions with security weekly there's no right or wrong answer it's all about but how you do have to show your work yeah show your work <laughs> And you'll be judged on critical thinking. So, John, interesting when we get to question four. John, three words to describe yourself. Three, three words? Three words. Oh, gosh. Detailed. You stated the question. Uh, That's two. Might make note of that. Uh, creative. I'd like to think I'm creative. Uh, and, uh, boy, I never actually thought of that. Wow, these are hard questions. This is the first one. Uh, right, detailed, creative, and uh, uh, analytical. If you were a serial killer, <laughs> what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, it would have to be a stool. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping uh, he didn't follow that with the word. Stool in <laughs> what context? <laughs> right. I was really hoping he didn't follow with the word sample, because then <laughs> very interesting. Oh, John, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, what a long, strange trip it's been. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, this is question four, huh? Yes, this is uh, question four. Second. second. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, my. Live, dead, <laughs> fictional, or otherwise. Otherwise, uh, be nonfiction. Non nonfiction. Okay. Either alive or dead. No, because I was going to say one would be Deadpool for sure. But uh, uh. <laughs> that would be fictional. Yes, that's a valid answer. That, that's okay. valid. Is that the mother uh, or the father? Doesn't no, matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. It's just two parents. parents. One of your parents. Uh, Deadpool and uh, wow, that's a damn good question. Uh, Gamora. There you go. Oh, what a lively bunch. Excellent. <laughs> John, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Thank you, guys. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back. John Morin from DF Labs coming up next. Stay tuned.